Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Amanda Mall. I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic. Uh, I cover contemporary lifestyle. This is Katia Beauchamp. Uh, she's the CEO and founder of Birchbox. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about her business, uh, her customer model, how things have changed, and where they might be going in the beauty industry and beyond, just in retail in general today. Thanks awesome. for coming. Very excited. Impressed you already filed a story. <laughs> yes, I filed a story. Very before productive I came in. morning. <laughs> Journalism must go on. <laughs> so in 2010, you and your co-founder founded Birchbox. Uh, at the time, really the only thing you could subscribe to were newspapers, magazines, things like that. Yeah. Now, nine years later, you can subscribe to furniture, all kinds of things. Practically, oh, no. any, practically anything you can subscribe to now. Um, Birchbox sort of is the inflection point in a lot of that, I think. Uh, how did you decide, how did you come up with the idea to, to subscribe to beauty samples? So I think the first thing that I feel is important to understand about Birchbox is that we never set out to start a subscription business. Um, in 2009, just at the end of the year, my co-founder and I were in business school and we saw an opportunity um, in beauty. Basically, we were shocked to see that in 2009, almost 2010, less than 3% of beauty was sold on the internet. And we were like, that seems like an opportunity. Um, it seems like more people are obviously going there to write about beauty, to review, you know, look for reviews, look at content, but the purchase wasn't happening. And we got curious about why. And we came up with two hypotheses about why based on us as consumers. And they were very simple. And that was, there was too many choices in beauty and the internet actually makes that worse. <laughs> At least in four walls, it's finite, right? Like it ends. But if you were to Google, like I'm gonna kill yourself, Google best moisturizer, and you were gonna be like, huh? How are there like a million options that go from 10 to like a thousand dollars, right? It's, it's a ridiculous quest on the internet. And the second thing we realized was that um, people required trial before purchase if they were gonna change behavior. And we were in business school, um, very kind of practical about it. And we thought, this seems like a big problem for an industry that is so focused on newness, so focused on new launches. The beauty industry launches hundreds of thousands of new things a year. And the customer is overwhelmed by the choice and requires to try it to change behavior. And we were like, this seems like a big opportunity. How could we address it? And that is how we came up with this idea that we could push a little bit of trial in a way that felt digestible, finite, personal, and that that could then lead you to over time, really just change your behavior and beauty. Um, trade up in some cases, add to your routine, but it would feel very doable. And our vision was that it would feel like your best friend who was a beauty editor. So the reason that that was really important is that beauty editor obviously has access to everything, but the idea that your best friend is the editor means that they know you, they choose for you, and they care. Right. Um, and from there we said, okay, well, how could this work? And we realized, well, we can use samples. We can send it to you um, monthly. And then we came to this idea that we'll use a subscription revenue model. Subscriptions aren't business models, they're revenue models. And we got excited for sure. We were like, that's awesome. High five subscription seems good. Um, and then we launched it as a test while we were still in school and honestly spent you know, my entire life savings, which was nothing to just, you know, buy the domain, buy some boxes, and we made our money back immediately. And it was that idea of like the power of subscriptions, which, you know, in its most pristine sense is a negative working capital business where you get paid before you ship your goods is really profound. And it definitely created a lot of like momentum behind being able to build the business and capitalize it. One of the things your company does really well is serve customers who are interested, but not like addicted to uh, trying new things, trying new beauty products, yeah. things like that. Yeah. It provides a mode of discovery. Yeah. Uh, the beauty industry existed for 
decades, forever, before, before you came along to try and target those customers. Yes. Why do you think they were overlooked for so long? Um, so just to clarify, the beauty industry is focused on the consumers who love beauty the obsessed consumers, maybe going down to people who are very excited. So 20% of the market, the beauty industry really focuses on and focuses on inspiring that customer, creating product for that customer, creating retail experiences for that customer. And the rest of us are just invited to partake in this when they're, it's not our value system, right? But I think the reason is really simple and logical. If you go back decades, um, you had, you know, four channels on television. Like first there's radio, then we have TV. There's four channels. There's, you know, you basically have everybody watching the same thing and you can advertise to this consumer. And of course you're going to choose to talk about, you know, talk to you about your industry and about your product to consumers who love it. Now, fast forward to today, um, we are able to just be very nuanced and thinking about who a target customer is. And when we started Birchbox, my co-founder and I were just women who did not obsess about beauty, would never have read a beauty magazine, used it, but just felt kind of perplexed by why it felt hard to feel good using it. Like it felt like we were buying things that were a waste of time or too expensive and we didn't love it. And we thought that was ridiculous. Um, and that was, you know, the early days of Birchbox in 2010. But in 2014, we looked at the industry because we were industry outsiders. She was a consultant. I was in finance. And we saw something that should have been obvious, but it was a really profound moment for us, which is every beauty retailer is focused on this customer who's obsessed, you know, the Sephora's, the Ulta's, and that customer represents the majority of their revenue. Now we were focused on our problem, you know, ourselves, our value system and beauty. And we were far over indexing and women who were fine to apathetic about beauty. And they would come to Birchbox kind of skeptical and then double their spend in the category within a year. And for us, that just became really interesting. We were both economics majors and we were like, you know, we're so much more intrigued by the idea of growing a pie than taking our slice. It just seemed more interesting. And it's hard because our customer is by definition less interested in beauty. Right. <laughs> you how know? do you find not looking? How do you find people that are by definition just less engaged, le not looking for you? You talk to them the way that I think um, we all hope to be talked to. You know, I'm less interested in beauty and, and all of you have your different things that you're passionate about and different things that you're less interested in. But here's what I think and here's what I think resonates with consumers. If it's a discretionary spend end, it should be joyful. You don't need it, right? And so it's ridiculous to think that for 70% of the market who are buying beauty, so this customer, the casual consumer uses 11 different products in a daily routine. She still buys it, right? There's a lot of stuff to do, um, but she is not buying it with joy. She's not buying it with passion, but she's definitely purchasing. And for that consumer, this idea that her, you know, dollars are no one's priority is ridiculous. And I think starting to talk about, you know, even if you don't love the industry, you still deserve to feel smart when you buy it and feel like excited to use it. You don't have to just be resigned to the product graveyard or doing what most of our customers say. They've been doing the same thing since they were like 12 or 18. You know, I mean, they're in their 40s now. They're, they're like, I still use the same thing my mom took me to the beauty counter to get. And so I, our vision is like, you know, we can take the work out and then you can have this experience of discovery that really honors your values and really, you know, speaks to how you want to participate. And I think in short, I mean, it's tricky is the answer, but in short, we just try to tell this story in a variety of ways. And our vision is to be at this intersection of utility and delight, but to remember all the time that we are defining delight for our customer. So delight for a customer who's not obsessed for, with beauty. And that's very different because every time, you know, I go to, different talks about beauty and beauty conferences, the way that everyone talks is as though every customer wants to look a certain way, right? Like everyone loves this idea of being totally made over and very much learning how to shape your face and contour. But my experience is that most of us are just trying to get out of the door and look like <laughs> decent. And 
And actually, I think most of us want to look like ourselves. You know, I don't think most women are like, all I want to do is transform. So from this angle, you might think I'm a celebrity. <laughs> most of us are just like, we, we're fine. You know, right. we just want to look a little more awake. We want to look, you know, like we feel our best self. Um, so I think just trying to have that right, conversation right. and say like, you are awesome. You deserve to be someone's priority. We've chosen to take this on. Right. A small programming note. In about five minutes, we're going to go to audience questions. So please be thinking of them now. Uh, and please, when it's your turn, keep them short and ask them in the form of the question. Pretend we're on Jeopardy. <laughs> do I have to say what is? <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Um, we're just yeah. going to do that for the rest of the talk here. Um, so now I'm interested, when you started your company in 2010, and then pretty soon after that emerged the twin behemoths of YouTube and Instagram. Uh, yes. <laughs> and those... What did we do before that? <laughs> I can barely remember. Um, I'm going to say something controversial. Yeah. I've been off of Instagram for six months. Yeah? How do you feel? It's a good life. <laughs> it's a good life. And look, I, I feel like it was a, it's a very important part of how we've built the business, but I'm very curious about new paths. I, I was saying in the green room that, you know, one of the things I believe in about building a business, I'm sure several people here are building a business, is that if you have the choice to build a business for the world you want to live in, you know, build for the world you want to live in, right? And I think there's amazing things about social media, but I also think it's created a lot of challenges in terms of like people's connections and even, you know, our connection as a company with our consumer. Like our aspiration, our vision is to be forever useful and always delightful to our consumers. I mean, that is, that's crazy, right? We want to be in your life forever. That is what we're saying. And this idea that we have, you know, 0 0.02 seconds to get your attention on social media and to like try to build this connection feels challenging. And, and I thought, you know, I'm kind of, I've never been super excited about creating connections there. And I'm curious about whether if I come off, it will help me feel more creative and thoughtful about what's coming next, you know, what's happening with how consumers are trying to build those connections. Obviously, my team's still very much there. We're still doing a lot in social. But I said, you know, something is happening. I'm not alone in thinking that people are, you know, kind of overwhelmed by the amount of information coming at us. And as a company who wants to build a relationship with you, I need to be tuned into that and thinking about, well, what's the next way? because it is getting harder and harder and extremely expensive, as you all know. As far as sales go, there's online, and then there's still brick and mortar, which uh -huh. people are tr still trying to figure out how to do. The retail landscape has changed so much in the past 10 years. Uh, you guys tried retail stores for a little while. You decided to exit that market, and now you've started a new partnership with Walgreens. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what you learned uh, in your retail stores and then how that applies to your yeah, retail efforts sure. going forward? So we, we actually didn't exit. What happened was this Walgreens partnership started while we had our own store. We still have another store in Paris. Um, and it just started getting a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. And our lease was coming up, so we were like, we need to focus on something. It's, it was a bit of a different model. Um, and Walgreens came like about because we started talking about this opportunity that we saw respectively in the markets and we started talking about the casual consumer and they were like nodding their head yes like they were like this is the opportunity this is the customer that we think we can win with too you know what if our experience in physical and your experience in digital and passion for this customer could create a really great experience so we said let's test it and then let's see if this is is working and um you know, just like any test, our expectation was you put the test in the market and there's a lot of inter iteration before there's traction and that just wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of became a little bit consumed in our team that's small, I mean, not really existent at the time for physical retail, was consumed by it. And we said, let's focus on it because we're so meaningfully changing sales in that channel for, you know, prestige beauty. And now we want to know, could physical retail be a channel for acquisition for the subscription? 
So we put a lot of energy now into training um, for sales associates to talk about a subscription, which is different. Um, so far, you know, we've had some success early on, but we are just rolling it out now in 3,000 doors where all of the sales associates will be trained to talk about and sell a subscription on a tablet. So we've, you know, just been really focused and curious. And I think this idea of, you know, how do you have these real connections with consumers? How does that turn into customer acquisition? How does that become a big expansion of customer lifetime value and revenue? And then, you know, trying to go fully into that has been the game. And I'm very... I'm very interested in, the, in how this could affect the business and how it could really change our business mm -hmm. because the implications are really huge. I'm sure as everybody in this room knows, you know, if you're a, a primarily digital company, you're spending a lot of marketing dollars to acquire consumers. Um, but I think what's always felt, you know, weird about that for me is that if you tell somebody about Birchbox, if you just say, you know, our intention is for you to have joy in discovery and for you to feel it's efficient. And oh, by the way, you can get it for about $13 a month. Um, and you can have this experience of discovery that really feels personal and contained. I, I mean, nine out of 10 people are like, uh-huh, yeah. So I was always like, well, why are we spending so much money to convince people? It feels like there is a customer that's kind of readily available. And I think these conversations that are happening in stores are us understanding like is that the case and then can we get excited about investing more in the experience of engaging with the customer in store as well as the product and how that the product is the tool of customer acquisition and customer engagement and lifetime value so mm -hmm. i think it really gets to change where you spend your money on the pnl and that is super exciting to me as mm -hmm. as the market continues to change mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one or two questions. Uh, the mic runners are coming around. I think there's some here. Yeah. Yeah, hi, my name's Edward. I have a question about the sustainability practices of Birchbox. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Yes, um, so great question and definitely something that we're continuing to look at for 2020. So today we make all of our, you know, the physical packaging of the product out of post-consumer waste and everything is able to be recycled and we do carbon offsets. Um, but tomorrow the customer is definitely asking about options with less packaging. Um, and we're very much excited and looking into that too. I think the beauty industry in general you're starting to see like slight um, inclinations towards like reusables, um, but it's still extremely new. Um, a world I want to live in though, to that point. Uh, good morning. I wanted to, um, if you could speak a little bit about your uh, suppliers. Has your model changed uh, the manufacturing of products or who oh, yes. is in the, in the game? Yes. So our partners are um, beauty brands, right? The brands that um, make all of the beauty products, many of which you know that are from the large companies like L'Oreal and Estee Lauder and LVMH. We also work with hundreds of small independent brands from all over the world. Um, and yes, I know we've had a big impact on how they think of coming to market. So prior to Birchbox, um, kind of the paradigm for coming to market was that you had to get shelf space. I don't know how many of you think about that, but it's kind of the big play in retail. There's this classic case in business school about the beer companies fighting for <laughs> linear feet. Um, and so getting into shelves of major stores is how you start to get in front of customers before you have marketing dollars to do that. And it's a huge inventory ask to to create that kind of awareness this way, right? So to be in, you know, some some stores have thousands of doors, that is millions of dollars of inventory just to go to market and hopefully it sells, right? And so Birchbox is a very different um, proposition for brands who, especially brands that don't have that kind of capital and size, they're able to take dollars that would be used on various things in marketing um, and or inventory and start to turn it into samples that immediately come with, you know, on the other side, we purchase the full size product, right? So um, they can immediately understand 
the, the value of acquiring a customer this way, but we're very much a partner in how you understand like the impact of it. Who is the customer that's interested? Is this product that you launch kind of a good, what we think of as a gateway drug to your brand? Is this the right thing to sample? We consult on that too. So we give a view on what we think will be a good product from that perspective. Um, and the other piece of the industry that I know we've impacted because they love us so much are sample manufacturers. They've been exploding. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of new ones. And this is a whole new category um, that's just really grown because of Birchbox and other companies that use samples. Okay. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Katya, thank you for coming this thank morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the talks today.